Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh once again. I'm, I'm busy clicking on the button to admit. Okay, in the last lecture, I mean, we were still discussing uh, all the cases here, case law. Okay, and actually, right. And actually, we have um, managed to discuss uh, class, I mean, cases under class 2A, which were public finance, okay, we discussed already. And we have also discussed Rosli Daros on Banchai. And all kids, kita, we discussed it thoroughly. Um, I mean, we also have discussed the case, lah, okay? But basically, all kids and skinner is all, it also falls under class 2A cases. So for today, we are going to, to continue okay, with class 2B cases. But still, okay, uh, despite all the cl classification here, uh, the, mis, the most important thing, the gist, okay, what, what to be proved uh, from the relationship is that uh, fiduciary okay, relationship of trust and confidence in order to prove domination okay, uh, for the first element of presumed undue influence. So for today, we are going to start with the case of Southern Bank and Abdul Rauf Rakinan and followed by Tate and Williamson and Polygram Records and the search. Okay, let's go to the slide. Okay, we have discussed this. Okay, here. Okay, we were here. So the case of Southern Bank, um, Berhad and Abdul Rauf bin Rakinan here, uh, it was reported in year 2000. So who are, the who are the parties in this case? So plaintiff, obviously, Southern Bank, so lender, lah, the bank, the financial institution. And we have two defendants here. Okay, the first defendant um, was the borrower. And uh, in terms of uh, relationship okay, between first and second defendant, so the first defendant was the husband and second defendant was the wife. And as far as the second defendant was concerned, the wife stood as the guarantor for the loan taken by the husband, okay, the borrower. The wife is not the borrower. Okay? The wife was only the guarantor, guarantee, okay, guaranteeing the, the loan taken by the husband. So the, the, the specific loan granted by the bank here is overdraft facility, uh, it's a type of loan. Uh, and then, um, and later there was default, I mean, uh, the husband defaulted in payment. Okay? Now, um, the bank okay, was suing both of them. Lah. Okay, usually, uh, the bank will, um, I mean, will ask the, the borrower to pay okay, the, the loan. But if the, the borrower didn't pay the loan, now the, the bank will, will, will run after the guarantor. Okay, but when the wife, when the second defendant was sued by the bank, okay, now the wife put up the defense. Okay, now meaning that here the, uh, the undue influence is, is now being used as the defense. So second defendant, the wife defended okay, the, the, the bank's claim, okay, plaintiff claim, and then the wife alleged okay, undue influence. Okay, on whom? On the bank? No, not on the bank. On the part of the first defendant. Meaning that here the husband actually exercise and the influence on um, on the wife okay, when at the time she signed okay, at the time she executed the guarantee agreement I mean that here is is not um uh, her free consent okay, when she signed the agreement and then this is the observation uh, actually i have a copy of the full report of the case but i uh, i mean for the purpose of discussion today we just we just zoom to the relevant section i mean a relevant part of the um, judgment so as far as the the ratio okay, of the case uh, is concerned okay, the court made it clear okay, section 16 okay, of the contracts act okay, as well as whatever decided cases in relation to section 16 it make it clear that there is no presumption of any influence between husband and wife I mean here yeah, uh, the court um made it clear it doesn't fall under class 2a okay, as far as the fixed categories are concerned okay? but then it's always possible for the wife to prove the case of undue influence against the husband the court um, went on further to say that where the wife has been induced okay, to stand surety okay, i mean to be the guarantor for husband's debt uh, by his okay, by the husband undue influence so of course the wife has the right okay? she has an equity the right um, I mean, the legal rights under equity, because this is from common law, okay, as against him. So, what's the effect to the transaction to set aside the transaction? So, it's possible provided all the elements are fulfilled. So, the wife have, has the right to do so. So, that's basically the, the observation. It's a long argument, actually, and also the court discussed thoroughly. So, you might want to read the case later. Okay, and then this is another important factor. I mean, the unique part of this case. It, um, okay, why the court accepted the, the argument by the wife here? By the wife here, uh, in his defense, okay, in her defense, the wife said that uh, because of her pregnancy, meaning she was pregnant, 
And then um, the reason why she agreed to be uh, the, the grantor for the husband's loan year, uh, her desire to have matrimonial harmony. Okay, and then um, they were not really on good terms. Okay, there were con continuous quarrels and also scoldings, and all as well as assault okay, by uh, the husband towards her, okay, towards the wife. And because of that, she was vulnerable, and um, she doesn't have much choice actually. Okay, succumb to her to her husband's undue influence. Okay, so she she was made to sign the guarantee prepared by the bank. And after all, another um, another. Uh, uh, additional okay, argument okay, which supports the earlier argument is that she said when she became the guarantor, okay, her standing surety for her husband um, loan, okay, actually it doesn't really benefit her directly. It okay, was not to her financial advantage. Okay, the loan was not meant for her lah, basically. So that's why um, it doesn't benefit her at all. So uh, it made the, the allegation, okay, her, her cases, her case stronger, lah, basically. Okay? So all the argument here. So this is the unique part of Southern Bank and Abdul Rauf bin Rakinan. Um, later, I'm giving you uh, the full report so that you can have a quick look. I mean, you can have a, a quick reading okay, to understand or to appreciate the case better. Okay, let's move to the next case. Still discussing class 2B. Tate and Williamson. This is another leading case. You might find this case uh, um, in any of the common uh, English law textbook. Okay? Tate and Williamson. Reported in year 1866. So this, what, what kind of relationship involved here? So it's between uncle and nephew. And the nephew here, um, very young, okay? he, he was very young, undergraduate nephew, I mean, uh, yet to graduate lah, uh, in college or in university like you all, okay? And as far as um, the uncle was concerned in this case, okay, he was the one who gave financial advice to his undergraduate nephew. And later he made the nephew to sell off the property to him, okay? nephew's property to him. And then it was undervalued, very, very cheap price. Okay? And then when the, uh, later, the transaction was being challenged okay, for being affected with undue influence. And the court um, accepted the argument. Okay? The court set aside the sale of the property. Why? Okay, what's the reason? Because it was undervalued. Okay? So it gives some, uh, it's like red flag. Like, okay, why? Why the sale was undervalued? Okay? From the nephew to his uncle. They, and they, are, they have this fiduciary relation. Okay? And then the, uh, the court made it clear, okay, the court said that the uncle, okay, they are not stranger to each other. So the uncle stood in a confidential relationship, okay, the relationship of trust and confidence to his nephew. And the uncle should not have purchased the property, okay, without the fullest communication to him of all material information that he had obtained as to its value. Actually, the uncle concealed, okay hit certain uh, report from the nephew. So that's why the nephew uh, didn't know okay, the real value of the property. That's why um, the, the transaction as a whole was being affected by undue influence. Even though the nephew actually appointed his own um, lawyer, okay, independent solicitor, but the solicitor was not um, aware of this surveyor report. The uncle was the one okay, who has all the uh, important information about the value of the property. So the uncle has to, I mean, had had to uh, disclose, okay, had to reveal the report before he made a purchase, but he purposely okay, concealed this report so that he could uh, buy the property under value. So eventually the sale was um, being set aside for being affected which, uh, with undue influence. Okay, another important case, Polygram Records, uh, Suram Berhad and The Search. Yeah? The Search is a very famous uh, group still in existence until today okay uh, and the case was reported in year 1994 and as far as the case was concerned it is a case of breach of contract but the the search okay, the group um raised up the defense of under influence when polygram records uh, um uh, suit them okay for breach of contract okay let's go to the facts here the plaintiff okay entered into a written agreement okay they, they have to contract they signed to contract here okay with the group uh, after this, okay, we are going to refer to the next slides. And then uh, a few months okay, after the first contract was entered into, was signed, okay, um, there's involvement of one party, uh, Eric. Who was the Eric? Eric was the managing director of Polygram Record. So Eric said, well, we need to sign another contract, another new contract. Okay, let's go. Well, I mean, let's have a look. What's the content of the first and second contract? Okay, for the first contract, it was made for a period of two years. And there was an option for two further periods of one year age. I mean that, yeah, 
2 plus 1 plus 1. So the group was bonded lah. They cannot record, cannot do the recording elsewhere. And then as far as the option, okay, the right to extend here is only given to the recording company, not to the group lah. Okay. All right. So this is only a purely discretion of the recording company. And then um, Eric said, no, no, we need to sign another contract. So now they make certain changes okay, uh, with regards to the first contract. So significant modif modification here is with regards to the period of the option. Okay, just now, I mean for the first contract, two plus one plus one. But later when second contract was signed, it became two plus two. Okay, two plus two. All right, instead of two additional periods of 12 months. Lah. Okay, mean here, the contract became longer. Okay, and again, eh, the, the option, okay, the right, okay, the decision whether to extend or not, lies only within a uh, polygram. Okay, the, the, the group cannot say, oh, we want to extend or we don't want to extend. Okay, the group has to obey, lah, has to follow whatever decision or discretion by uh, polygram records. So now, actually, the group was dissatisfied with the royalty later. Okay, when they sign, only later they realize, oh, royalty rates was so low. Okay, um, it doesn't commensurate their effort or their popularity whatsoever. So the group was dissatisfied okay, with their existing arrangement with Polygram, whatever contract that they have signed. Rem remember, it's too late actually to back off from the contract. You have signed it. So the group complained to Eric okay, because Eric was the one who said, oh, we need to sign another contract. So the group complained uh, to Eric that they were unhappy with the royalty rates, but nothing much can be done. So the group now made uh, their own decision. Okay? The group made the recording. Okay? Uh, they, they made the recording of an album, new album, under a new company, their own company. Okay? They named the company as Go Search, and they are the one who established or incorporate, incorporated the company. They are not happy with Polygram, so they go and record it elsewhere. And that one was actually the act of breach of contract. That's why now Polygram Record uh, sued them okay, for breach of contract. So um, when they were being sued, now this is the defense. Okay, defendant counterclaim. They claim back lah, against the uh, against the recording company, against the plaintiff. And um, some of the grounds of um, argument here, okay, counterclaim here, they said that, well, we want a declaration. Okay, whatever contracts that we have signed, okay, actually, they are all void. It okay, was the reason, by reason of plaintiff undue influence over uh, the, the, the the I mean the, the group lah, okay, over the search. And then especially on the second contract, okay, because it made the uh, the period longer, okay, recording period became longer. And to support, okay, to substantiate their claim of undue influence, so this is all, all the grounds lah. They said, oh, we were under undue influence. Okay, why is that so? So this is the reason. First, they said, well, we are not familiar with business matters. Okay, and then the second argument, Special relationship okay, between uh, us and Eric. We trusted Eric. Lah. That's why we signed the agreement. And then they said um, they, they, they were lacks of the independent legal advice. No lawyers whatsoever lah, when they signed the agreement. And then another reason which is actually connected with the second argument here. Total reliance okay, by the defenders on Eric when they executed, when they signed the second contract. So this is all the argument under um, undue influence, especially with regards to, to the second contract. And then um, when the court uh, examined, okay, analyzed all the facts, all the arguments, so the court came to this uh, observation and decision. Okay? The court said, yes, okay, when you uh, rely okay, on uh, presumed undue influence, okay, you, um, whatever relationship between the group and the um, the company, I mean the the, uh, the managing director Eric here, so it's not under class two A. Okay, it doesn't fall any under any of the fixed relationship. So if at all, if it really exists, it must fall under class two B. So because of that class two B, you really need to prove that you were really under undue influence. Okay, that's why the court said it is therefore necessary okay, for the defendants for the search to establish by evidence whatever evidence okay, that the defendant reposed trust and confidence in Eric were well, you really uh, trusted him okay, when uh, you signed the agreement so from the evidence from the argument the court was satisfied okay so the court said yes there did that there did exist a close relationship between the group and Eric but later we are going to rediscuss this case under the second element, which is unfair advantage. And um, the first element was fulfilled. But when uh, when we come to the second element, the, the group didn't manage to fulfill it. That's why eventually there's no case of undue influence. So both elements must be 
fulfill. Okay, but for the first element, yes, the court accepted their agreement. There was actually um, fiduciary. Okay, there was domination okay, between uh, the recording company and also the search. Okay, uh, now we come back to section 16. Okay, uh, I'm showing again um, the provision. Okay. And and I will share contracts at contracts at okay um okay section sixteen one we have read together okay basically um uh, I mean it lay it lays down okay the important elements but section sixteen section two okay it focus more on the Domination, okay, uh, the first element basically, okay, in particular and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing principle, okay, a person is deemed in the position to dominate the will of another, okay, uh, this is the, the way, lah, all right, where he holds a real or apparent authority over the other, or where he stands in the fiduciary relationship. So basically, we have been discussing about fiduciary relationship, okay, and after this, we are going to discuss uh, all other ways okay to prove elements of a domination okay position to dominate the will uh, where he makes a contract with a person whose mental capacity is temporarily or permanently affected by reason of age so this is another way lah. okay let's say we don't want to prove the case under fiduciary or maybe such um, factor doesn't exist so there could be some other factors okay, in which the party the victim or the plaintiff can prove the case under undue influence okay we go back to the slide just now. Okay, we were here. All right. So, okay, we are discussing, okay, fiduciary, okay, uh, fiduciary relationship, and we were discussing, um, I mean, dominant position, basically. All right. Obtain your unfair advantage, that one will be the second element. Okay, I mean, the, the chart here, it doesn't really tell which one is the first element or which one is the second element. Okay, now we are looking at real or parent authority as well as mental incapacity. Okay, our dominant position. Okay, so what's the meaning okay, of the word dominant position here? So basically, um, the straightforward meaning is that the other party, okay, uh, the one who dominate, okay, was in a position to dominate the complainant's will. Complainants, um, independent decision, okay, the consent basically, right? The will is dominated. So, uh, other than referring to common law cases, we are also referring to uh, cases from India. Why is that so? Because our Contracts Act is in pari material with uh, Indian uh, Contracts Act, okay? Uh, it's just uh, the, the numbering, okay? Just uh, one, I mean, uh, uh, for example, if us is section one, then the contracts India in section two. I mean, just um, I mean, in terms of substance, um, more or less, it's, it's like hundred percent similar or the same. Okay, so the case is Raguna Prasad and Sarju Prasad, in which the court discussed what's the meaning of um, the the phrases or the word dominant position, and the judgment was was um, I mean, it was made by Privy Council. That's why it is also very highly persuasive for us, lah. Okay, Privy Council. Okay, what happened between Raguna Prasad and Sarju Prasad here? And this is appeal case, okay, because it went up to a, a Privy Council. So the appellant, okay, was the borrower and uh, he was also the property owner, the one who owned the property. And respondent was the money lender, I mean, the one who uh, gave the loan. Lah. So appellant, the borrower, so he borrowed um, 10,000 rupiah from the respondent. Big amount because way back in year 1924, okay, 1920s. And then shortly afterwards, okay, um, they signed and I mean they entered into another agreement. Respondent executed a mortgage. The first loan and then mortgage. Mortgage more or less is, is like in Malaysia um, charge, okay, charge document or mortgage, like more or less similar. Okay? Mortgage for a loan of um, 10,000 uh, just now, okay, mortgage with, and the interest is so high, okay, 2% interest, not yearly, this is per month and it is compound, compound. I mean, you accumulate lah the interest. So for the whole year, if the loan is not paid um, after a year, so the interest become, it's not 2%, okay, 24%. So very, very high uh, interest rate here. 
now the borrower okay argue okay contended that well the lender you are the money lender so you took unconscionable advantage because he was so distressed usually the one who took the loan is under mental distress i mean distress lah was uh, in need of money okay and because of that you exercised an influence over me so that's basically the um, argument the argument by appellant towards the the lender the one uh, who um, loan out the money lah who give the money and because of that okay because of this money lender and the borrower position here transaction was unconscionable it okay, was um uh, i mean was really unfair okay or was being affected by an universe under section 16 subsection 3 of uh, contracts act of india okay 1872 and because of that the loan contract you know, as well as mortgage contract here uh, was voidable okay for a new influence but privy council said no 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 okay it's not that easy okay it's not that straightforward the uh, privy council said it must first be established okay, that the lender was in the position to dominate the will of the borrower okay and then as far as the case was concerned okay this appellant okay the borrower failed to prove that the lender was in a position to dominate his will i mean you came forward and you asked for the loan and later you uh alleged that, that you were under under influence so that was not right lah, basically and then the court said um privy council also said there are three matters under section 673 must be dealt with in proper order i mean one after another according to the sequence cannot jump okay and as far as our um, uh, contracts act is concerned, after this, we are going to refer to the illustration. Okay, We are going to read such an illustration D as well as illustration C. Okay, And it's comparable. It looks similar, but it's different. For illustration D, okay, um, the things that we learned, the analysis is that an urgent need of money okay, on the part of the borrower will not place the lender in a dominant position. I mean, you still have um, the, the concept under the right. Okay. You can still think whether you want to take the loan or not despite that you will really desperately need the loan you cannot simply say oh the money lender was in the dominant position because you really need money okay no it's not i mean that is not the position but then compare with illustration c uh, i mean uh 16 after this okay, i'm showing it to you okay but if there was already existing lender borrower relationship and later, money lender extracted unusually high rate of interest for a fresh loan. I mean, there are two loans. The first loan and later, second loan. And second loan, um, high, I mean, higher interest rate or very, very high interest rate. Then in that position, it's possible to prove to the court that the court will deem uh, the money lender was in a position to dominate the will of the borrower because they were already uh, under lender-borrower relationship. But if it is a first loan, a fresh loan, then I mean it will fall, it will fall under illustration D rather than illustration C. So that's basically the difference between uh, illustration C and D. Okay, let's go to the real illustration, actual one. Um we are, I mean, I'm resharing contrast act just now. We are looking at the illustration. We want to have a look at illustration C and D. Okay. All right, we go to D first and then we compare with uh, C. A bit bigger, 150. Hopefully you can see. Okay. okay. Illustration D. A applies to a banker for a loan at the time when there is stringency okay, in the money market. The, bank, the banker declines to make the loan except at an, at an unusually high rate of interest. I mean, here, this is the fresh relationship. Lah. Okay, the first time ever, uh, A wants to get the loan. So, um, after A think about it, okay, even though it's very, very high interest here, A accepts the loan on this term. And can we say that A was under influence? This is a transaction in ordinary course of business. I mean, you have the right to go to this bank, to that bank, or maybe all the bank. Um, impose very high interest rate and now the contract is not induced by any influence okay, that's basically illustration d compare with illustration c here a being in debt to b i mean he already got a loan existing loan okay, being in debt to b the money lender of his village so a later contracts a fresh loan okay, on terms which appear to be unconscionable i mean all the whatever terms are imposed by the money lender. So now, can A um, go, go to the court and say, court, I was under an influence. Okay, it's possible. So it lies now on B to provide all the evidence okay, to prove that the, the contract was not induced by a new 
influence. I mean, B has to disprove the allegation made by A because um, court, I mean, the court will presume uh, presume on behalf in favor of A. Yeah, that's why the, the I mean the case fall under presume and influence. Okay, the court will presume. Okay, the thing happened. The thing exists. Okay, and influence exists. And now B need to disprove lah. Prove that the, the contract was not induced by undue influence. Okay, um, we go back to the slide. Okay, so we were here, we are done with this. Okay, another way to prove domination can okay, just now dominant position. Okay, that's this discussion or explanation basically. Now it's about real or apparent authority. Usually it's straightforward. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. Okay, authority. What's the meaning of the word authority? Okay, um, but as far as the case law, case law is concerned, okay, we don't have any case law on this because it's quite straightforward. So does it provide for any de definition or interpretation of the word of authority here? So it doesn't. So we can just refer to the general meaning of the word authority. So basically, as far as under influence is concerned, it may refer to domination. Okay, under, it doesn't matter. Is it under class 2A? Is it under class 2B? Is it under actual? Is it under prism? Doesn't matter. So long you prove that the one who dominates was the person with authority. Most of the time, I think it's about superior and the one who was below him. Lah, okay, the one who is uh, lower in rank. Okay, because usually, um, is it the word inferior? Okay, the one who has inferior position, will need to follow whatever thing said by the superior, the one who has the higher authority. Okay, that's basically the general meaning of the word uh, real or apparent authority. We don't have case law on this, so it's quite straightforward. Okay, fiduciary, we have discussed thoroughly. Okay, it, it refers to relationship of trust and confidence. We all we also have illustration A. You can read on your own. It's about parent and child. So basically, um, the law okay, will presume straight away okay, a parent stands in fiduciary relationship towards his child, especially under class 2A lah, okay, between parent and child. And the case is Tengku Abdullah and Muhammad Latif bin uh, Shah Muhammad. Okay, uh, we discuss actually trust and confidence thoroughly when we discuss class 2A and class 2B. So basically, it's about the same thing. Okay, now we, we want to focus on mental incapacity. So it's not about uh, trust and confidence now. Now we are proving, we are focusing on the part of mental incapacity. Okay, the one who is being dominated is mentally uh, incapable of making independent decision. Or uh, I mean, the free consent is affected because of the mental Incapacity. So um, again, actually we have read can just now section sixteen, range two and B. You can see the word mental incapacity and the uh, illustration which is relevant is illustration B. You can read on your own because now I want to focus on two cases. We have um, first the very very old case, a case of from Singapore, okay, in Chinoria and Shi Ali. It was decided based on common law, but because we are also uh, adopting common law principles, so it's relevant for us. Okay, in Chinoria and Shia Ali, and we have slightly uh, recent cases which is um, reported in MLG, more or less similar to in Chinoria. Yeah, it also involves uh, a person with mental incapacity. The case name is Lim Kim Hua and Hui Chui Lan. Okay, reported in 1995. Let's have a look at the case. In Inchin Oria and Sheikh Ali bin Omar here, who was the plaintiff? The plaintiff was a Malay woman, okay? And she was very old. I think if you read the report, uh, she was 80 or 80s, lah, okay? very, very old. And as far as the case was concerned, he, she was wholly illiterate. I think it was not surprised because that one in year 1920s, can. So she was wholly illiterate, cannot read at all, cannot read or write at all. And then um, he, she was the auntie of the respondent. Okay, so it's between auntie and the nephew. Okay. And then uh, what happened was that um, this lady, okay, this old lady, uh, the appellant, she executed a deed of gift of landed property in Singapore to her nephew. Remember, if you see the word gift, it's just one way. I mean, give away everything and you don't receive anything in return. Lah. Okay, give away wholly. Okay, the, the ownership. And then as far as the appellant was concerned, because she was a very old uh, lady here, very old woman, okay. She was a feeble, very weak, okay, old woman, and she was unable to leave the house and she relied entirely upon the respondent for everything. So for food, clothes, key okay, management of affairs, including financial affairs, yeah. So she had no knowledge of her own affairs, okay, and she doesn't know okay, the value of her properties. 
Okay, and then the nephew asked her to sign lah. Basically, the deed, okay, the document, uh, give away the property. So when the appellant, the appellant executed the deed, okay, her relationship with the respondent was sufficient. So because of the relationship between them, okay, the court say yes, we can raise the presumption of undue influence because you are not stranger to each other. Okay, and now it falls on the respondent, the, the nephew, okay, to prove that the gift was the spontaneous act of the appellant. Of the appellant, okay, of the woman acting under circumstances which enable her to exercise independent free will. Could she do, do so? Couldn't, okay. So, respondent was unable to rebut the presumption because the court raised presumption now, okay, is under presumed undue influence. So, because of that, the gift was considered as affected with undue influence. So, the gift was set aside, the gift was voidable, okay. You might say, who, who actually uh, challenged? I mean, whoever, um, uh, or should be entitled to, to the property lah. Okay, it shouldn't be given to the nephew can. There could be some other person who, who was entitled to the property. Okay. Now let's compare with Lim Kim Hua. More or less similar. Okay, Lim Kim Hua and Hui Chui Lan. Uh, Plating was the grandmother, also very old. <coughs> Excuse me, very old. And we have two defendants. It is now only one defendant. First defendant was the daughter. Okay. Second defendant was the granddaughter. I mean, the daughter of the uh, daughter lah, daughter daughter. So granddaughter. And as far as the grandmother was concerned, um, she owned. Okay, um, she was the registered proprietress. Okay, we have the word proprietor and proprietress. So proprietress is the woman lah, of a piece of land. Okay, and on the land, okay, not the empty land, not the vacant land, stood a shop house. So very high value of the property. And then the grandmother actually executed a will. Remember, a will will take place, will take effect after the death. Okay? So she signed a will, devising and bequeathing, okay, leaving the shop house to four of her grandchildren, including the second defendant. Okay, after I die, I'm giving away all the property to my all grandchildren, okay, four grandchildren. But later, before she died, okay, she executed memorandum of transfer. But nothing left for the will. Okay, I mean, transfer straight away during her lifetime. So, memorandum of transfer. Now, she transferred one half share, half, okay, of the shop house to the second defendant. And after that, she signed another one, okay, um, transfer, uh, transfer another half share to the first defendant. I mean, the mother. First to the daughter and then the mother. So, now property gone lah. Nothing left for the will. Okay, zero will. Right, that's why, um, the, I mean, the transaction was being challenged okay, by all other, I mean, the one who is entitled to the property, okay? So this is, uh, the I mean, the, the facts just now. All right. And when the case was brought to the court, they challenged the validity, okay, the, the validity of the, uh, the transfer was being challenged. And the court said, yes, there was sufficient evidence okay, to show the existence of special relationship between plaintiff and the first defendant, the daughter, okay? And then, as far as the facts was concerned, okay, the plaintiff, okay, I have two minutes left. The plaintiff was living with the first defendant, okay, who provided her with food, okay, accommodation, okay, and then first defendant was entrusted by the plaintiff to manage the offense. So, more or less, it's quite similar to uh, in Chinura case just now. So, uh, and it's very clear okay, from the facts here, yeah, the court said, plaintiff was very much dependent on the first def defendant, okay, in both her physical and financial needs because she was old okay, and she had a poor memory and she was also illiterate. So similar to in Chinoria. From, from all these factors, okay, all the unique factors of the case, undue influence can reasonably be inferred. The court said, yes, we can infer. Okay, we presume there was undue influence when the, um, when the transfer was being done, okay, was being affected. All right, so lucky we, we are done with the first element okay, of presume and you even. Okay, in the next lecture, we are going to complete our whole discussion. We are going to discuss unfair advantage, the second element, which is applicable only for presume and you influence. And then uh, we are going to discuss um, presumption. Okay, after two elements are being fulfilled, then the court will presume okay, the presumption is being raised okay, in favor of the Complainant in favor of the one who is being dominated. And then on the part of the defendant, okay, now they, they have to rebut the presumption, disprove the presumption which is being raised. I mean, it's fair on both parties now. Okay? So if it is being rebutted, no case of undue influence. If cannot rebut the presumption, there is undue influence. So that, that's basically the flow okay, uh, of proving the case under undue influence, especially presume undue influence. Okay.
Alright, and then this is just a little uh, subtopic, okay, under undue, undue influence, okay. And the last part will be effects and remedies. Okay, let's start share. All right, that's all for today. Um, we are going to continue. We are going to 